So, so why don't you tell us in, uh, in, in your own words your, your sort of path to where you are now, sort of how you found and carved out your career as a pianist. It's been a crooked path. <laughs> um, you know, I was saying earlier to you that my, my view of the way you have a career in music is they drop you down mm -hmm. into the middle of a jungle and they give you a sickle and you have to hack your own path, you know? And as you're going, sometimes you get stuck, you can't cross that river, you gotta go over here, then you, you, know, you try to find your way out of the jungle. And life is the same thing, but you don't get the sickle. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, for me as a career in music, I mean, I just, I, I was, I just grew up, you know, uh, originally in the South, my father was from Mississippi, my mother's from New Orleans. I grew up in New Orleans and in Memphis till I was about nine, then we moved to Berkeley, California. So I was exposed to, exposed, exposed and exposed to more, you know, bluesy kind of stuff. My father had grown up in this little town of Indianola, Mississippi with B.B. King and Albert King and Muddy Waters. They were all right in this little area and then a jazz sax player named Brew Moore. So he played me a lot of that kind of music. So when I was four years old I started figuring out stuff on the piano and doing that. But you know when we moved to Berkeley, California in the 60s, which was a whole other deal, you know, protesting, marching, very left-wing socialist parents, you know, that whole deal. And uh, it was really good to be a jazz musician there, you know, people were into music. And actually, I played drums and, and rock bands and sang and, you know, did all kinds of stuff. I was in a band called the Electronic Cucumber, uh, you know, playing drums. And uh, we got that name because we had a contest in the neighborhood, and that was the best name they could come up wow. with. So. I yeah, can't imagine what the others were. We had like a little card that said Electronic Cucumber, and we used to play gigs at UC Berkeley, you know, for 25 wow. bucks or something. And then in high school, I had a fantastic experience because I had a really great music teacher there named Bill Elliott, who and they had theory and ear training courses. He had a jazz band. There were a lot of great musicians that came out of Berkeley High School. Uh, I had a guy named Lenny Pickett, who's a band leader in our Saturday Night Live now. Amazing tenor player. We grew up together. Uh, Johnny Otis Jr., Johnny Otis' his son, was a percussionist. You know, a lot of great musicians. This guy, Steve Elson, who's in New York now, is a professional sax player. So. Uh, you know, it was a great, great place to come up in the 60s playing, playing music. And, you know, I, it's not like today. I mean, you know, you know, it makes me sound or feel like an old man. But, you know, it, I never, ever, ever thought about music business or career. I, I mean, those words weren't in the lexicon of our left-wing world. It was art. And I just thought I would just stay in my room and practice the piano and it would all come to me. And, you know, and if you read up on Bill Evans and people like that, that's kind of how they approached it. It was like, I'm going to take care of the music and everything else is going to happen, you know. Because in those days, you could have a real career as a, as a musician. You could just be a player, you know. Now, I don't think you can. Now, I think anybody that I see, including famous people like Lovano or Lieben or Dave Lieben, you know, any of my friends that have careers, or me, you know, we all do other things. We all teach, we all write music, we travel, uh, do things like this. I mean, everybody has to do it. You kind of cobble together a career. Which is, but when I came up, I just played, man. I just played. I got in bands really young. I joined Cal Jader's band when I was 19 years old and started touring with him. I was a jazz, Latin jazz vibist. And through him, I got to play with so many great people Tito Puente and Willie Bobo and Amanda Peraza and, you know, just so many great musicians, you know, uh, that sat in with us and uh, uh, that, uh, that played with Cal. Uh, when Sheila E. was 10 years old, she sat in with us playing Kungas because her dad was Pete Escovito and her, her, uh, her uncle Coke Escovito, which shows you where those guys were at, were percussionists that played a lot with Cal Jader. And, um, you know, so we, and we, what was nice was used with Cal Jader, and we not only played gigs, we played dances. We'd go to East L.A., go to Puerto Rico, New York. Wow. We'd play Latin dances, you know, it was a whole other thing, which showed me a lot, you know. I'd say, oh, that's a different way of playing music. So in the 70s, music was, I think, more a fabric just of everyday life, dances, clubs, hanging out. You know, when I moved to New York, man, I just, there was no internet, there were no cell phones, you know, there was no computer thing happening. It was all about hanging out. It was all about, I'd wake up about three or four in the afternoon and eat and I'd practice the piano and play with friends. And, you know, I had a group of friends, great musicians, Victor Lewis, the drummer, uh, Barry Finnerty, guitar player. We would get together every day and do ear training. We just for fun. We thought, let's do our training, man. Let's develop our ear. We'd take this, this uh, really cool book called Modus Novus, which was all these fourths and fifths and really wild sounds. And we'd, one guy would play it on whatever instrument they had, and the others, we would try to transcribe it. You know, I was never that good at it, but you know, it was a good, good practice to do. 
And then I'd go out at midnight every night and I'd go to all the clubs. And if you're a young musician, you know, when I went to New York in 74, maybe five piano players moved to New York that year or six. This guy, Armand Dinelli and Andy Laverne, Bill O'Connell, uh, Mike Cochran, and some guys like that. You know, we all moved at the same time and we could go to any club for free. It was like, hey, come on in, man. Hang out, the Vanguard, Boomers, or you know, all these clubs. You know, that was the world. Then that's how I met everybody. Jimmy Cobb, this guy, that guy, you know, whatever. Bass players, Ron Carter, whoever was out. Oh, you're a new cat. Okay, just check you out. Sit in. You want to play? You know, and, and, and you know, you'd, you'd get some kind of like phone call thing, or you'd have an answering machine, or there was there was an answering service that people had, and that's really how you did it. It was a very small community, but it was all on the street. It was all about being out. If you didn't go out, it wasn't going to happen. You know, and I liked going out at midnight and hanging out all night. That was fun. And then there were after hours clubs. Then all the clubs closed at 4 a.m. and then you'd go to the after hours clubs where there were all the drugs. And, uh, but all bands played. That's the first time I met Hiram Bullock. He was playing in an after hours club. All, he and Danny Gottlieb and Mark Egan had come up with Phyllis Hyman from the University of Miami and they were playing after hours clubs. And I said, oh man, come over here to Walter Booker's studio. It was the bass player with Cannonball. I said, let's go play, you know. That, that's how it hooked up. Now it seems to be so much about the internet and, you know, Facebook and all that, you know, and I do all that, but to me, still in New York, if I go out and hang, I, it's much more, I get much more happening. It's just, for me, it works better. But I still have to, you know, email, you know, email this guy or whatever I have to do to make it happen, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's how I came up. I came up as, it was prehistoric in that way, you know, no computers, no cell phones. Um, mm -hmm. I think we certainly didn't get distracted by those things, so it was much more focused on the community of, of people and playing music together and trying to find musicians that you were with. And how every gig I got was through a friend. You know, I got the gig with Ayerto Morera and Flor Perrin because, uh, I don't know, maybe probably Barry Finnerty, the guitar player, had the gig. I got the gig with Sonny Rollins because Eddie Moore, the drummer, said, well, use Mike, you know. So that's, that's how it went. It was really that way. It's by playing, you know, making contacts with people and hanging. But that's why I went to New York, because that was the center. And you didn't need a car, you know, you just, you still don't. I live in New York City. I have a house in LA and I have a place in New York, but I'm mostly in New York because my kids are in school there. They're teenagers and they're musicians. So I just go out, you know, it's, it's, still, it's still happening in that way, but not like it was, but it is still happening. What are, uh, I mean, we have a lot of students who are gonna be out playing, playing jazz for their career uh, in the future. What are some <laughs> of the questions? <laughs> are you sure you wanna do that? <laughs> well, I guess everybody here wants to get a degree so you can teach, too, right? I mean, I don't, whatever. Uh, what, what are you guys' majors? How many people are education majors? Music ed. How many are performance majors? Oh, what else is there? Composition? Any, can you major in film scoring here? Uh, we have a class. You have a class. How about music business? Can you get a degree in music business? All right. So can you combine, like, performance and business, or you can, you can kind of mix it? All right. So, uh... Some students may be thinking about moving to New York. As someone who's lived there and has worked a lot of their career, what are some of the questions they should ask themselves, things they should consider for making that move? Well, buy a gun. So, um, <laughs> no, uh, New York is so safe now. When I moved there in the 70s, it was so scary. I'd go to the, I lived in the Upper West Side, and I'd go to this 96th Street you know, subway, and people would be falling out of the window and throwing stuff at you, and you know, guns would be going. I mean, it was a whole other world. Now it's so safe compared to you can just go out and hang. I mean, look, I mean, uh, my feeling is if you really want to be a player, you should go to New York. You should go to New York and be ready to scuffle and, you know, live in Brooklyn or Queens or whatever. It's super expensive. It's not like when I went to New York. It's very expensive to live in Manhattan. But, um, you know, I feel if one can be discouraged from being a performer, you should be discouraged. And if you can't be discouraged, then you should go do it, you know. And especially when you're young, before you're married or hung up or have something that keeps you from doing it. If you want to really be a jazz musician, uh, I mean, New Orleans is a great place too, but it, it's a different musical thing here. You know, and I love it. I mean, I've always, you know, I'm from here. I always came here and played. I always played with, you know, Mazikowski and Madakovich and James Singleton and all those guys, man. We played together since, the, you know, late 70s, 80s. You know, I love those guys and they're amazing musicians. But I think if you, you know, it just depending on what you do, if you go to New York, it really is, you know, trial by fire. But it's great, you know, we have the new school, we have NYU, I mean, I teach at the new school, uh, and I also teach some at NYU, and, uh, but I'm really just mainly a, a player there, and, you know, a 
writer. You know, I lived in L.A. a long time because I did a TV show and I did film scoring and stuff. And L.A. is a whole other ball game. You know, there's much more of the businesses in L.A. that's non-jazz. You know, so if you want to do pop, if you want to do film scores, definitely go. If you want to write film scores, go to L.A. immediately as soon as you can, because that's the only place where they make films. You know, they make like what ten films in New York, and they'll make like a thousand films in L.A. You know, so. But to me, to just play jazz, if you want to check your muscles, you know, check it out, play with the cats, go to, I think New York is a really fun place to live, the most exciting city. I think Paris is cool too, Paris is pretty cool right now. But, yeah, I had a question. Maybe in, in moving, New York, you know, there's like right. sort of insecurity, like, you're competing with the world right. over there, oh. you know, yeah. everybody's there, and we're just coming out of, like, right. country and stuff like that. Just coming out of what? Our, our degree, finishing our degree. Right. Here. Uh, like, what kind of situation would you just say, like, like you're saying right now, like, just go, or would you wait until you get a little more experience in certain things? You got to go when you feel like you can go, you know. If you don't feel like you're experienced enough to go, don't go. But you can certainly go visit and check it out. Yeah, sure. Go up for a couple of weeks and hang out, right, or a week, or, uh, you know, just go feel it out, you know. I mean, New Orleans is a great music town, so if you can be here and get a chance to play with some of these great musicians here, that's a great thing to do, too. You know, you're lucky. There's hardly any place in the country that's like this. But I'll tell you from traveling, every place has great musicians. You know, Madison, Wisconsin, you're gonna find your amazing piano player and your horn player. You know, every place you go, you're gonna find somebody great because you don't have to be anywhere. You can listen to records now. There are a million books. When I was coming up, there was one book on jazz by this guy, John Mahegan, and it was indecipherable, you know, because he was not allowed to write the melodies because of copyright, so it was all numbers. Three, you know, three eyes with a dot over it was a three minor chord to a five seven, and that was Stella by Starlight. I go, what the, but, you know, and uh, you know, he had some voicings and everything that were pretty cool. But and there was a guy Jerry Coker who had written some pretty cool stuff. I mean, there were a few things, but it's not like now. I couldn't believe it when I saw that that book with Herbie Hancock stuff written out that he played with Miles. You know, I mean, that's like, oh God, that was like the. So it's a, it's another world now, but. One thing I will say is that even with all the education there is now, even all everything you guys are learning, it does. And I was saying this before. It doesn't make any. There are not any more great innovators than there ever were. You know, being an innovator is a whole other thing, and I'm not sure going to college does anything for that. You know, college it just gives you an opportunity to learn a lot of different things. And so, I, if I were doing it again to go to college, I would not just study jazz. I would, if there were world music, I'd definitely get more into that because that really helped me. I've played a lot with, you know. Taba players, Indian people, you know, all different kind of world musicians, African, South American. And I think that's really good. I think as much classical composition and theory, I would study that 20th century, 20 early. What I don't even know if there's 21st century harmony to study, but I went to, when I went to New York, I studied privately with a woman named Ludmila Ulela, who wrote a great book called Contemporary Harmony, who had taught classical 20th century composition to people that were my idols, like, you know, Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock, and that's how I found out about her. So, when it's time to go to New York, you know, just go check it out. I mean, you don't have to, you know, the living part of New York is really difficult. But what I, when I've seen these students in NYU at the jazz program, and I, that thing costs about $60,000 a year. If you could get your parents to give you $240,000, go to New York, get an apartment, study with the best guy that you want to study with, you probably have a more chance of being a player. <clears throat> but you won't have your degree, you know. So I think now to teach, I mean, I think you have to have a master's probably to get any kind of decent teaching job. But it's, you know, I, I get an interview once and a woman at the end of the interview said, I have to ask you, my, my son wants to be a jazz musician. Do you think that's about as realistic as being a stagecoach driver? And I said, no, I think you could get a good gig as a stagecoach driver. <laughs> you know? So I think you have to be realistic about it on the same, on the, on the other hand, why be, you know, when you're young, why be realistic? Just take a shot, you know? What's the worst that could happen? It doesn't work out, you go somewhere else, you know? That's how I look at it. Uh, well, would you be so kind as to maybe play something so we could uh, start to get some, get some hands-on jazz advice? Yeah, if that's what you guys want, we, I can play it too. I mean, I, I mostly play with, you know, groups and stuff like that, but I can just play a... I mean, what are you performing, guys? Is there an emphasis here? Is there an emphasis on standards? Is it, is it a lot on New Orleans music? You know, what are you guys doing? What are you working on? 
anything. We got a pretty big standard <coughs> standard drive. Yeah. Because yeah. you know when I came up, I'll, I'll tell you when I was with Cannonball. You know, Cannonball was always saying, "Look, man." I'm so happy you're in the band. I'm trying to get that last foot out of Birdland. He said, Quincy Jones and I are trying to get over bebop. And so I was never a bebop player, per se. I mean, I played those tunes, but I never played it like a bebop player. I just made a bebop album with this baritone sax player, Ronnie Cuber, you know? And man, whew, you know, for me, it's like, it's a, it's a railroad track. It's just not the way that I hear it, you know what I mean? So I think you gotta, I think it's important to really clue into what you love. You know, and and I guess if that's the thing I would worry about, you know, or maybe not. But if you, you know, if you study, just take it with a grain of salt. You know what I mean? Because you gotta. The thing about being a jazz musician, the way I was, came up with Cannonball, Sonny Rollins, Nancy Wilson, all these people. Nancy less so because it's accompanying a singer. But everybody I played with, there's a great sax player I played with for a long time, Joe Farrell. You know, a lot of great musicians. Everybody was trying to come up with something original. You know. And coming up with something original isn't always about being educated. It's about, it's about getting into yourself. It's about communing with yourself. I don't know if you've ever seen this video of Bill Evans called The Universal Mind. Yeah. And he says, you know, I wouldn't want to deprive you of the joy of finding it yourself, you know? He said, I could, he said to his brother, I could show you all these voicings. But then, you know, hmm, is that really how you... He didn't feel... I mean, he didn't find it that way. Bill Evans wasn't a guy that transcribe stuff and listen to a bunch of records that was you know you know he figured it out some other way because he said he never had that great an ear and I can tell you I never transcribed anything people always talk about transcription I tried a few things but I'm not into it I, I'm not a big believer of it I'm not against it if you want to do it people think it's a great way to do it that's cool I mean if I hear something I like I want to you know I was just teaching uh, it's Bryce here I was just teaching him a little bit I was saying yeah if I find something like I was listening to something else you know Cannonball and he does this great solo on Autumn leaves, so I was listening, and he does this one thing over a D7 chord, you know, and he plays. So I say, oh, I want to see what that is. Oh, double diminish, you know. I want to, I want to analyze it. So when I listened growing up to Chick Corea and Herbie Hancock and Keith Jarrett and all those people, I never tried to emulate them, or I, I could kind of imitate them for fun, you know, like at a party. But I really wanted to understand what they were thinking about. What was their concept? You know, what was their global view of the music and their playing? Because Everybody had their thing. Chick had this double diminished scale thing and this Ravel thing going. And Herbie was, kind of, I could hear that Wynton Kelly and kind of George Sharing. You know, whatever it was to me, I wanted to get inside their mind and then say, okay, let me pick apart what they're doing and what I think I could do. Like Brad Meldow was talking with somebody about it, with Jackie, right? We were saying, so what do you like about it? He goes, well, the contrapuntal thing. I go, great. So rather than imitate Brad Meldow, why don't you just try to be contrapuntal, you know? So to me, it's like, can you, you know, with Keith Jarrett, I love Keith Jarrett, but what's the thing about Keith Jarrett? Okay, he's got this beautiful touch. It's his touch. If you look at his technique, you can't believe he sounds like that. He's all tensed up, and he's got all tendonitis and shit, and he's all messed up. The guy's amazing. I think he's the greatest, probably, piano, jazz piano player ever, you know, in terms of that. But if you analyze what he's doing, you can kind of take it apart and saying, oh, well, he's playing these ballads with these fingers, and then he's isolating this, and he's doing that. To me, I'd rather do that than try to imitate the way you know, to me, that's just the way I approach it. I want to go within what my soul is and find the harmony my way. So, that, I think that's a good approach to it. Anyway, that's how I do it. So, I don't know, playing-wise, um, I mean, I don't sit and play a lot of standards that, you know, I'll do the, like Someone in Love. Do you guys know that tune? Just mess around with it. I'm going to try a lot of different things. One thing I do is I take a melody. I'll just show you how I kind of practice it. It might be more fun. I mean, I could do a performance. You know, but no bread, you know, so. Um, no, so, you know, it's a little dry of a vibe. I'm really about the audience and the, but, but I mean, one thing I do is I'll just try different approaches to it. So say I take a melody and I'll start on a certain chord and I'll play a different chord on every, every melody note. And though this one's like. Right? So I can, you know, the regular way would be, oh, you know. sharing approach or something, you know, it's pretty. But you could also go down, you know. You know, and I've never done that before. But it's just taking a melody and doing, to me that's more fun. So, you know, uh, da, 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 da. 
I always like that A flat there. To me, it's like just fun to get inside it, you know, kind of take it apart. And then you can do what we're talking about the counterpoint. stuff around and then you could try to do it really you know Keithy where he does this amazing stuff he'll you know It's just like getting inside it and doing it, you know. I don't know if I even want to play that tune on a gig, to tell you the truth, you know, it wouldn't be. <clears throat> but if I had a band, then it would be. You know, I'd figure the bass player would probably do some pretty regular stuff, and then I would try to... A lot of my thing is harmonic thing against the bass notes and trying to play up a half step and moving things around. So if I was playing... Just move things around and then come home, you know, land in there, maybe. You know, rather than playing so inside it, to me, it's like trying to feel like I'm going somewhere else in the air against it. So to me, it's very kind of like, you know, color and tactile and all that stuff while the band's moving around it. That's how I kind of see it. You, uh, you have a lot of experience working with a lot of different groups, mm -hmm. um, and you and you speak uh, just now that even when you're even when you're <laughs> improvising, uh -huh. it's not just about what's in your head. Uh -huh. It's yeah. a really group experience. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> could you maybe say a few mm. words about about what you uh, what you think about when you're playing with a group, or some some experience you've had in finding a good group, or uh, or some bad experience you've had with working with a group? Yeah. Well, I, the fun for me of being in a group is the people and the interaction, you know. I think it's like a, like a conversation, you know, if you're at a party with people and you're all sitting around having a conversation or whatever, or people get distracted and they come back in and then they talk and, you know, it's like, I think music is like, the language of jazz or the language of improvising and music is like, 
you know, you just have a conversation. We all know English and we all know grammar and we know all that stuff, but we all know slang and we all have our own ways of talking. And there are people that are more unique than others in the way they speak and the words they use, but we all can communicate and, you know, then you don't know what you say something and somebody else answers you, or, oh, yeah, I, I, I know that joke, here's another joke, or whatever. That's how people communicate. And that, to me, is the fun of playing music. You know, I like to play. And to me, in a way, the more quirky an individual, the musician, the more fun it is for me. And uh, so groups, to me, I mean, I, I have had a lot of different bands of my own, and I've been in a lot of different bands. And my favorite bands are the ones with the people who are the most unique personalities, uh, personally and musically, you know. And sometimes you get a person who's, who's maybe less uh, together and playing all the styles or, you know, whatever, but he, his personality is so strong, it comes through, it really gives the band a specialness. And I think Miles Davis was the best uh, band leader I observed, who just went through tons of great musicians. And, you know, some had strengths and some had less strengths, but whatever, he used their individual individuality as musicians to help his music change and he really kind of stayed the same pretty much as a player I mean he you know did a lot of got more chromatic and out and everything but pretty much was kind of a bluesy cool trumpet player but all the stuff around him changed dramatically from the 50s on to the you know 70s and 80s so and I think I think he was totally into the individuals you know he was I hung out with him this great guy who really you know I, I thought it was very cool and very creative so I mean, I remember experiences, you know, when I was with Cannonball's band, I was really young. You know, I was 22 and they were all, they seemed old to me in the time. They were probably in their 40s or something. And, uh, but I remember playing a gig in Philadelphia and, and it was the first time I really understood group playing. And in my mind, all of a sudden I had the image of a gigantic circle, like a pie. And I could see that where each musician, the bass player and the drummer, or sax player, whatever, were playing, they were taking up pieces of the pie, and the only time I should play was when there was a space in the pie for me to play in. And if it was all filled, I should just wait. Because, you know, as a piano player, you're comp accompanying, right, a lot of times. So I realized that if you clutter up the pie, it just sounds bad. It sounds mushy, it's not directed, it doesn't taste good, you know, that idea. So I always think of a band as however many people there are, it's just slicing up the pie, and they have that percentage of the pie. And sometimes, a bass player has the whole pie, you know, he's taking a solo, sometimes he doesn't, sometimes he's just playing lines, you know. That's how I, that image came to me and it never left me, you know, it just, I always said, oh, that's what playing in a group is. You know, I just got it. So to me, playing in a group is, you know, it's like people in a conversation, you know, when people are high and they're all yelling and talking over each other, they're not really communicating, you know, or people are in an argument. Yeah, well, you know, they're, they're not communicating, but when people are communicating, one person talks and the other person listens and then that person talks and another person kind of chimes in and you know, sometimes two people can kind of overlap and it's cool like that but to me that's what a group is. So I like to have a group where I really want to hear what the guys have to say. And I play with a lot of different musicians over the years, great musicians and so it just depends, you know, and generally the ones that I like, like with Cannonball's band, he had, you know, this great guy Walter Booker on bass. To you know, not just the, not the greatest technical bass player in the world, very good, but amazing feel, great personality, great person, just, w he had warmth in his playing, very supportive, but, but also he could play real high, and, you know, just great to play with. Roy McCurdy, a really fantastic drummer, who had his own kind of sense of time, and, you know, every, they, you know, Nat Adderley, who technically was not the greatest trumpet player in the world, he played cornet, but he just really had a great soulful feel, and, you know, Cannonball, who had his thing, so it was, everybody was really saying something, and, Everybody had a lot of warmth in their playing, so I think that band, the band that reminds me the most of that, and the person that reminds me the most of Cannonball is Christian McBride. Whenever I hear his band, he's got that bluesy warmth underneath everything he does, and that's just something you can't, it's probably the people he picks, you know. I heard a band he did recently, he had this guy Christian Sands on piano, he's a young guy who's finishing up at Manhattan School of Music, and this amazing vibes player, Warren Wolf. I don't know if he did, you know, just, just young guys that just, but they all play, they all had that quality of warmth and bluesiness, no matter how out they got or whatever. And so, you know, it's just, Miles had a different thing in his bands. Tony DeGrotti has a different thing in his bands, you know. I mean, I heard him play in January, Tony, with the Astro Project. Man, you smoked uh, every band at that place, you know. I heard, I heard so many things. It was mostly so lame. And this, that band was so happening. You and Singleton, and mm, the, who's that drummer, man? That guy was awesome. Uh, Simon. Wow. Yeah. Mm. God. 
and Razakowski. That was some of the greatest music I've heard. Wow. So you have and so much energy and warmth and everything they, now that's a band where everything they played had its own thing. You know, I was just talking about bands and how, you know, certain bands have a vibe, you know. And everybody in that band is a unique character, for sure, you know. Mm. So that, that, that's how I look at it, you know. Yeah, it's like a person, yeah. Um, you talk about like all these different quirky personalities coming together. How do you go about, or like, how have you seen hmm. band leaders kind of bring everybody onto the same page so these quirky personalities are connecting and like they're all on the same? Well, mostly they don't do anything. I mean, you know, if you're doing something specific musically, you might need to talk about it. I mean, so, you know, Liebman, Dave Liebman loves to just talk, talk, talk. You know, everybody's different about it. He loves to talk about the music, you know, and that's his way. But most of the bands that I've been in, Sonny Rollins, Cannonball, they don't say a word ever to me. Nancy Wilson, they don't say a word. You just figure it out. And when I have bands, I, I want to, it's like casting. I want to cast the right people so I don't have to say too much. And, you know, I might if I'm saying, hey, man, you know, that symbol is burying me here, you know, or something like that. I don't mind saying that. But in terms of, the only thing I will say to somebody in my band is, hey, uh, you know what? You can just play anything you want. I want you to. I want you to be wild, or I want you to be free, or I want you to. You know, I, I just. I just feel like if I'm gonna hire people that know how to listen, the band is gonna play you. You know what I mean? The musician is gonna play you. So I have. I. I'm trying to think if I've been. I probably have been in bands that I hated. Oh, I'll tell you, I hated Jean Luc Ponty, that vi that violin player. I hated playing with that guy. It lasted about three months, because he was very rigid. It was right after Cannibal had died, and I'd played with. You know, Cannibal was such a magnanimous, open, beautiful musician in person. It was like, man, play what you play all over the keyboard and, you know, forget bebop, forget about all the stupid, you know, rules and just play, you know? And John Ponty is, I want you to play this scale. I was like, fuck you, man, I'm not. <laughs> so I just turned my shit up to 10 until I got fired. I just played all, all this, I had an organ and a Rhodes and an art odyssey and shit. I just turned all that shit up. I was like, fuck you. <laughs> I was in Europe, I remember I said, this is gonna be my last concert, man. And it was, you know. <laughs> but that's just me, you know, and I was also very young then. Maybe if I took the gig now, I would know what I was getting into. But. I don't like those gigs so much. I like to be, even when I had a talk show band when I was on our Arsenio Hall show, I hired another keyboard player so she could play all that stuff I didn't want to play. And she would get all the samples, man, and play all the parts, and I'm just like, okay, you know? I didn't want to have to take care of that business. I mean, obviously, sometimes I had to, but I like to just be free and kind of be in the moment, and that's just my approach, you know? But I mean, if you know, if you're, that's with, if you're having a super high level, big time, I mean, I'm, I, this is what a guy said to me, and, I, and it's totally true. I'm a really good big-time musician, but I'm not such a good small-time musician. I don't know all the songs. Like, to get a gig with a singer and say, okay, this, dude, can you do this? To, you know, I'm not like that. I'm a kind of musician that if I'm with Sonny Rollins, I'm going to learn his music and play the shit out of it and be creative and do it my way. Or Nancy Wilson, I'm going to have her repertoire and learn how to conduct it. But if it's just a guy that's going to go on a gig and get called a million tunes, that's not going to be me. That's just not me. It's just not my... Thing. I mean, I know a lot of tunes, and I can work with any singer, but if they don't have a chart, then we got to work on it. You know, I'm not going to just show up and, you know, I see tons of people can do those gigs, but that doesn't work for me. I'm, I'm like a, you know, a thoroughbred racehorse that wants to run really fast and a really good track, you know, but don't have me out there in the field plowing some shit, because I'm not going to be able to do it, you know. And you got to know who you are as a musician. You know, I, I don't have the interest to do that. And I've played tons of gigs. I mean, rock gigs, country, western. You know, in the studio, I used to play in the studio. I love to go in the studio and knock some stuff out. But in terms of being in somebody's band and doing that, you know, uh, and I like a lot of different styles. It's not I don't like the styles, but it's just a different approach, you know. Like I, I was a, last summer I was an artist in residence at Jazz Camp West, you know, and they would have these late night jams and all these singers, and then I tried to do it once and like, night and day in this key. I'm like, oh, you know, forget it. I don't want to play with you. You know, it's not, it just wasn't me. Whether it's these other piano players, man, they could knock out anything. But I didn't feel like they really had something to say as an individual pianist. It's a different thing to me. And there are some people that can do both. You know, Herbie Hancock's a great accompanist, man. He can do anything and totally unique. I mean, everybody's different, you know. But, so I think part of being a musician is like part of being a person, you know. You know where you draw the line. You know what kind of people you like to hang out with. Am I going to do drugs? Am I not going to do drugs? You know, it was a big issue for me, being such a young guy on the road when everybody was doing blow in those days and everybody was getting high. And, I decided I wasn't going to do it. I mean, I tried it and it didn't work for me. And I think a lot of people aren't around and don't have careers because they got so messed up. And did, but that, I had to draw my own lines. And so you musically draw your lines, you personally draw your lines. 
And I don't mean being rigid. It doesn't mean that you're not open to other experiences, but I think you got to be real about who you are, you know? And that's in life, man. You, know, that's, you can't separate. I don't even know what the question was. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how'd Maybe you I should have done those drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how'd you get involved in, uh, in, in film scoring? I got involved in film scoring because when I was in high school, I had a, a little jazz group, and there was a guy who made a movie in high school, and he needed some music and just asked me if I would do it. And his father had like a little tape, like a, you know, TAC, I don't know if it was a, just a two track. So we, and he had a piano, so I took my bass player and drummer and we went up and I just saw this movie and I just wrote some music, some stuff, ideas and we recorded it and he kind of cut it in and I thought, that was pretty cool, you know. So after that experience, I just, you know, it was something that I thought would be fun to do, but I really never did much of it. And then I was a band leader of the Arsenio Hall show, talk show, and on that gig, we, they would sometimes do these pre-tape things in the day where they do a little comedy bit or something, you know, three minutes or five minutes, and they'd say, we need music. So I'd have to go and ra watch it one time when I have some music paper. And I didn't have time to think about it. I just, okay, they looked at me, do you know what to do? Yeah, you know, I just pretend like I did. And I'd just write some shit and go in. I'd get the band, and they'd put it on our monitors, and literally, we just, I'd just conduct them, and we'd play through it, and we'd record it, and it would go on the air. So I thought, yeah, that's pretty fun, you know? And it usually worked out pretty well. I had a good feeling for the drama of it. And so Marvin Hamlish, who was a composer, and he'd done a lot of different things, came on, and he, he thought, well, he saw me do it. He was, he was on for, I can't remember, probably some singer, and he was Liza Minnelli or something. I don't know what he was doing on the show. And he pulled me inside. He says, you know, you can make a lot of money doing commercials and movie scores. Are we ever thinking doing it? I go, I guess. He goes, well, here, call my agent. You know, so I got this agent. Dude never got me a gig. You know, but at least uh, it got me the idea that maybe I could do it. So I, I hooked up with some people who were doing it and get, did a few TV shows and some movies. And uh, my wife is an actress who's written some stuff. So she wrote, it was easy to get that gig. So she wrote some <laughs> movies that she starred in one, like a jazz movie called The Tick Code that you might want to check out. It was Gregory Hines' last movie. And it's, uh, I have Tourette syndrome, and it was about a 12-year-old jazz piano player with Tourette syndrome. And so I scored that movie. So I got some experience doing it, and I, had a f I met friends. Really, it's always through friends. So uh, a guy who's a producer of TV, and he, has, he just wrote this movie called The Lincoln Lawyer that's out right now. But in those days, he was doing a lot of TV. So he did a show with Eric Roberts starring in it that we shot down here years ago called Dark Angel. So I came down here. and. So we want to use a lot of New, uh, New Orleans guys. So I found a lot of New Orleans people, you know, Little Queenie, Lee Harris, and all these people, and we recorded, and then I wrote the score, you know, when I went back to L.A. So I just had some good experiences. I, you know, I'm not a master at it. I haven't done it tons, but I, I'm up for, like, doing a TV show right now. And it's a good way to make some money if you can get into it. Again, it's a full-time job, so I don't pretend to be a film scorer like my friend Mark Isham, who's a big film scorer, and we grew up together. And, you know, that's been his thing, but, you know, it's... It's good to be able to do it. And I think if you, if you guys are here, you should take advantage of that class for sure. Because it's, it's a whole, ex just musically what I find exciting is it's a whole other way to write music because you're, it's like I say, it's like making uh, custom fit shoes, you know? They give, the, the scene is the drama and then it's, you, you know, the exact start time, the stop time, when the climax and all that. And then you gotta write music to make that work. It's a real challenge as a composer. And it really gets you, it's really good, I think, for figuring out emotions in music and finding out that you have to write very transparent music, you know. If, I mean, the people don't like jazz and scores, but if you're writing some of this stuff, it's not going to ever work, work in a film. You've got to be this stuff. It's got to be transparent, generally. And if it's a big chasing, then it's just going to be... But you're, and you might do some stuff, but you just find you can't do your regular jazz stuff. It just generally doesn't work. So it really made me see it in a different way. And also when we did this movie, the Tico, there was a relationship with my wife Polly has with Gregory and watching the movie, it never really worked. And then I came up with this theme, I can't remember what it was, but. And the theme made the whole relationship throughout the movie work because it kind of had a sadness and a niceness to it. And otherwise it could have been a little weird. And so I went, well, there's some power in music, you know, the power in music beyond just, it doesn't just exist as music, it has feelings. So to me, as, even as a jazz musician, I always wanted every piece, it's not like, oh, we're gonna play some jazz, you know? It's, it's like, I want every piece of music I play, whether it's somebody else's or mine, I want each performance of it to have a feeling. I want it to be a mood, you know? I want to relate to the audience, I want them to feel something. I don't want it just to be, hey, that guy can play. 
I want them to like the music, you know. I don't really care if they say, well, he's a great piano player or not. He said, he played some great music. That's another concentration. That's another approach, you know. Have you, um, as a teacher, you've seen a lot of the pitfalls of various groups and students, some of the things that maybe they run into. Uh, are, there, are there things that stand out, some patterns you find w with working with students? Well, the patterns, I, I don't, haven't taught that much in the last few years, and now I've just started back teaching in the last couple of years at, at NYU and at uh, the New School. And I've been mm, kind of blown away by really how uh, not into it the students are, you know, how they show up late, and they just, I mean, I guess their parents are paying for it. But all I know is when I was coming up, I was so thirsty and hungry for musical knowledge. I mean, I would be early for any class I took or anything. I, you know, if I was studying composition, if I was in a jazz, you know, theory class, whatever, man, I'd be there at the door waiting because I wanted that information. And I'm so surprised that so many people are just so, you know, you know, when I first started last semester teaching this rhythm and blues course at the new school, you know, and it's, it's a really cool course and kids get to come in and everybody chooses a piece and they arrange it, you know. But they were showing up late, man, and I, I couldn't believe You know, I just assumed, well, we're all adults. We're all just going to play great music, and it's all going to happen. And finally, I just had to say, okay, here's the new deal. If you're more than 15 minutes late, don't come. Three, you know, you miss it three times, you're fired. You're out of here. And I had to give them a big lecture and say, you know what, you know, and this is true. You know, people call me all the time for musicians. I said, I'm not ever recommending you guys, any of you. If you were my band, I would fire you. So, you know, I can't believe it. So, I don't know. Maybe you guys aren't like that, but to me... If you're a musician, you got to be into it because you want to be doing it, you know. So and if I'm teaching it, that's why I said I got a big career. I got two teenage sons. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm on time every day. How how busy is your fucking life, you know? <laughs> you know that's how I look at it. So I feel like that's something that I could not believe. And every teacher I talk with in new school says, yeah, it's really changed in the last ten years. People have a different attitude. I don't know if it's just I don't know what's happened, you know. But I know when I got into jazz, you had to want it so badly because it wasn't. It wasn't just given to you, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like you're, now you're like rich kids because it's all there. All the books are here, all the teachers are there. You just show up, man, and it's all there. Well, for me, it was like I had to get a record. I had to beg Bill Evans to show me something or, you know, because I couldn't figure it out or the, I, I knew this bass player, Ray Drummond, and I'd go to his house, I'd go, Ray, you know, what's going on? He'd get out the books, man. It was like, it's like somebody was selling me some secret sauce, you know, or, <laughs> you know, like the first time you have sex or, I mean, it was like that, man. It was just like, I wanted it so badly, you know, and, and then that curiosity <laughs> stayed with me, you know. That is the jazz secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Wait, right on. Yeah. So, mm. that's how I... That's, that's what impressed me. Now, when we get going with the class, I've been really happy with the, you know, the new school is, uh, you don't have to have any SAT scores to go to that school. You have to be a good player. So everybody there can play. And there's some kids, I have two, there are two kids I work with who went to that really cool high school for the performing arts in Houston. And they're awesome. They came in, man, they're, ki they're kicking Sibelius really hard. By the way, everybody should learn Sibelius or Finale. Does everybody here have to learn it? Do you have to? Don't get out of this college. I know it, somebody can teach it here, right? Or they have a class in it. Or Learn that. Learn that. Learn that. Because I'm telling you, man, when you can write like that, oh, wrong key, boom, push a button. It's awesome. It's awesome. And it helps you write, you know, orchestrate. So that's one thing I would tell every student nowadays. Learn, a, you know, a writing program. Learn logic. You know, learn Pro Tools. I mean, you guys have to know all this stuff. You can get Pro Tools, you know, you can get it all on your laptop, really, and 300 bucks, you can get a little Pro Tools thing, you know what I mean? It's like, this is stuff you have to have, absolutely, if you want to be a professional musician now. You know, this is just too good. That stuff is too great. Learn to write like that. Learn to write without, I mean, I still, when I use a program, I still play it, you know, but learn to just type it in, man. This cat's a, I had this assistant when I was doing our TV show, scoring this guy, Mike Berry, and he'd gone to US, he, he had a degree in piano, he had perfect pitch and everything. And then he went to USC and studied film scoring. And everybody at USC has to learn finale. And that guy would, man, just be, you know, just killing it. It was awesome. It was awesome. I'd play a solo, and I've, I was in a movie uh, with Sigourney Weaver, and I played her piano player. So we worked on the stuff and went in the studio, and she's singing, and I'm playing my solo. Then I go, oh, shit, next week I have to play it on camera. I don't know what I play. And I don't want to sit there and learn it again. So he just goes, okay, shh, 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 music, man, boom. It's magic. magic. 
So you guys promise me you're going to learn it by the time you're out of here. How many people are seniors here? Do you guys, do you know it? Do you too? Okay. The rest yeah. of you learn it, man. Represent Loyola. That's right. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted you to sort of speak about uh, yesterday at our, at, our, at, our, at our jazz combo yeah. workshop, you talked about a tension between bassist and a, and a drummer's ride. Um, right. That doesn't necessarily have to be the same to have a good feel. Right. Could you maybe elaborate yeah. on that? Well, I think it'd be hard without demonstrating it, but if you listen to the great rhythm sections, I mean, we're talking about straight ahead jazz. You know, funk and Latin are a whole other thing. You know, it's a whole other thing from jazz. Jazz has another feel. To me, anyway, the musicians that I've loved have been the you know, way Ron Carter and Tony Wayans play together with Miles Band, the way Paul Chambers and Philly Joe Jones or Jimmy Cobb and those guys, you know, played. Um, you know, there's just those rhythm sections where they get this certain feeling, and it doesn't, and, and you know, and Brian Blade, you know, I just heard him with Patatucci, you know, and they're playing a totally free thing, and yet when they do that thing, that thing is there, you know. And uh, same with Vodakovich, you know, Vodakovich is playing all his Vodakovich stuff, but you know, when it's time for he and Singleton to do it, they do it, you know. And I just played with Singleton in November with Mike Clark at, and uh, Donald Harrison, we played at Snug, and when it's time to do that feeling, that feeling happens. And to me, the feeling is always, it's going down. I feel like it's going downhill. Oh, no, no, no. You know, that's the feeling. And then that way, anything I play is going to be on top of it. It's like surfing on a great wave, you know? And if the wave's no good, it's really hard to surf. But if the wave is just like, and then I'm surfing on That's how, as a piano player or a horn player, whatever, that's what you want to feel in the rhythm section. So to me, I heard the combo playing, and they weren't, there wasn't happening between the bass and the drummer. They were just kind of playing, and maybe by accident it would happen. Usually, my observation is, I mean, you guys know, I mean, if you deal with time, you know, time is, is a little tricky. But if you just deal with quarter note time like this, and let's just say, I mean, obviously, you're playing jazz, you're not going to use a metronome unless you're doing a film score, which is another tricky thing than doing jazz and film. But if you're doing it, and let's just say it's 120 or whatever it is, you know, there's a little bit in front of it and there's a little bit behind it. Nobody's playing most of the time perfectly. You know, you're pushing a little bit, you're coming behind it. Well, what I find in the great rhythm sections is the ba between the bass player and drummer, one guy's pushing and one guy's a little behind, or one guy's right on it, one guy's behind or pushing. There's a little tension. They're not in the same spot, the exact same spot like you would in funk where you want to go. You want the bass player to be right with that bass drum. But with this, it's about the ride symbol in jazz, and it's about mm, the, the bass line, you know. So to me, just being aware of that is, is super important, you know, so that it swings. And then as a piano player, I love to go forwards and backwards. So if the, I mean, I don't know if I can do it without a bass player, but if the bass is playing this, you know, and that's basically the time the drummer is there. And I want to play a solo, I mean, I can go right on. What I would rather do is go a little behind or you know I want to kind of mess around with it. I want to play with it. To me, it's like dancing through it, you know. So, and I don't. There's no rules. I mean, the bass player and drummer don't have to stay. They can trade back and forth. You know, the drummer can play some stuff and kind of jitter it up. I mean, you know, you're creating. It's like you have a home base of stuff. It's just like harmonically, you know, if you're playing in the key of C or in the key of C, but you, you, you can create tension, and then come back down to the key, right? So rhythm, you do the same thing. You create rhythmic tension, and you come back into your whatever your motor rhythm home base thing is. So that's what that's about. Uh, do we have any, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you a little bit more, like, detail about like your harmonic concepts about how you say, you know, when you go away, yeah. like how are you, what are you thinking about, what are you, yeah. or, how are you organizing your playing right. when you play out? Well, you know, there's a lot of techniques. If you talk to McCoy Tyner, he's not too organized about it either, you know. <laughs> he just, I mean, he's awesome, but I mean, it's kind of by feel, you know. So for me, I mean, I've tried a lot of different things. So the basic thing is if you look at your basic seven note scale, Let's just take the C Dorian mode, right? B flat major scale, right? So there are five notes here that aren't of the chromatic scale that aren't in it. So those are pretty much the tension notes. So that, I mean, that's how I kind of think of it. Well, here are these notes. So I'm playing. Have to 
play all of them. You can just play a couple. You know, that's a real kind of still inside way to do it. But you could take the whole thing and move it up with your left hand, and or you know, with the harmony, whoever's listening, you know, where you're going against the C. It's taking, it really is taking containers of sounds which exist within, exist within intervals. In other words, this fourth thing kind of exists within a minor seventh thing, or you can take this kind of a sound. I just think of, of colors and containers of sound rather than harmonic. Oh, I mean, sometimes I'll think about, oh, now I'm going up to a C sharp minor seventh over C, but sometimes I'll just think, I'm taking this sound and I'm moving it around. And I feel the tensions, and I, you know, it's, I've been playing long enough, and you, you know, it's not that complicated. So then, if you have a really strong th solo idea, triads, I find, trump a chord change. You know? So if you have a triads thing, and you're in down here, and you're playing triads. You idea, you know. But I think the non-symmetrical way of not being so organized is more interesting. And if you analyze Herbie Hancock or any of those people, they're not symmetrical. It's, because that's boring to me. I mean, it, it, not that I don't do it if I have to. If it's going fast, I'll just get. You know, but it's kind of boring. But if you kind of mess it up a little bit. This is how I feel inside me, that things are messy and dark. You know, I like it all kind of mushy and messy and stuff like that. So I think that that, it just. I just don't think there are any rules. Why do I have to play the chord changes? You know, I don't really have to. You know, if the bass player could do it. It's just sort of the agreement of whatever your band is and what you hear. And you know, I think one thing I I I would say to you guys is listen to yourselves. You know, it's one thing to go and like I like I'm not a transcription guy. You know, again, I would rather we if I want to look at Cannonball thing, I want to hear what he's doing and figure out harmonically what is he doing. I'm not so interested in in his licks. Just me, you know, or a piano player. Do I really want to do their licks? You know, I don't know. I mean, maybe if I love it. But I'd rather play, improvise, tape myself on my iPhone, record myself on my iPhone, and listen back to it when I'm walking around and go, wait, that was a cool phrase that sounds like me. I'm going to isolate that phrase and learn that phrase in all keys. Why am I going to learn Chick Corea's stuff? He's not learning my stuff, you know? So that's the way I say it. There's no reason you can't invent your own lines, you know? and then learn to move them around. I mean, it's obviously you want to study other people and emulate them, that's how you get a feel and, you know, you... But don't, but I, I wouldn't just listen arbitrarily. I mean, I, I saw, when I was a kid, I'll never forget Gary Burton gave a clinic and I was in high school and he said, don't just listen over and over to some stuff, you'll get it stuck in your head. You know, don't arbitrarily listen to a bunch of stuff. You should listen to what, you gotta tune into yourself. You gotta find, meditate on what moves you. And harmonically what moves you, rhythmically what moves you. Colors, timbres, uh, you know what I mean? Hmm. Be as into yourself as you can. You know, you know, my sons are actors, and one of my sons, my oldest son, took a lesson with Dustin Hoffman. He got to spend a day with him. And Dustin Hoffman said, you know what, when you're a character, you don't have a responsibility to the script or the director or the other actors. You have a responsibility to you and your character. You know, fuck them, let them be mad at you, whatever. And that, he's a genius, you know? So I think as a musician, you have a responsibility to be true to you. And it's hard to find when you're young. And to, frankly, the more influences out there, you know, I go on YouTube and I'm checking out stuff, it's confusing. And that's one thing Bill Evans said. He said, it's confusing. If you just try to follow the lady, it just gets confusing. So you've got to somehow cut it off and get deep into yourself. And, and I, think, I do think recording yourself at every possible chance is one way to do it and listen to yourself. You know, Frank Sinatra would listen to himself to work on his stuff. I mean, somebody said, oh yeah, he's in the, he's in the car and what, did, what does he put on? He puts on Frank Sinatra and he's listening and goes, yeah, I could have done that better. Let me think, you know. You, you are your own artist. 
you know? And it's better to be, I, I think, a kind of a messy original than a wonderful copy, you know? I mean, that's what's happening in Japan. When I first went to Japan in the 70s, the, uh, the, all the musicians there were copying people. So you'd have your Charlie Parker guy and your Herbie guy and all that. But now, now they're Japanese people are just, they're just the artists that they are, you know? They've gotten beyond that since they kind of mastered the form. Well, you guys grew up here, you know, most of you, or, you know, whatever you've heard enough of music, I would imagine you got the form, you know, try to use it. It's like great, what is it, great, uh, good composers borrow, great composers steal, you know. Steal stuff and make it your own, but then try to come up with your own stuff. That's my advice. And, you know, hopefully you have something inside that you want to, that you want to express, you know. It doesn't mean you can't express it in a bebop thing or whatever, whatever the thing is that you love, but just try to be real to yourself, you know? That's my advice. Well, we're just about out of time, Mike. Uh, before we go, could you let us know where we can find you on the web or, or where we can get in contact with you, follow, your, uh, follow what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a website under my name, MichaelWolf with two Fs dot com. I have a Facebook, you know? All that stuff. But uh, I, go, I don't go on it too much, but every now and then I like to go and see, some, see the messages from my friends, you know? But um, yeah, that's it. You know, I, if I'm, like, I think I put a thing that I was going to be here on my Facebook thing. But you know, I don't. I get all these requests for friends. I don't always know how to find it to you know confirm it. I'm not so good at that. But I can do it on my iPhone somehow. It's better. But anyway, that's all. The website's pretty good for gigs and stuff like that. And listening, you can listen to all my music and records and stuff like that. I'm sure you guys all have websites, don't you? Working on it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to have a website. There's a thing called Jazz Corner, and there's a woman, Lois Gilbert, up in New York, and the most, or a lot of jazz musicians are kind of, she kind of runs their website, and it's pretty cool, you know, it's pretty cool, it's not very expensive, but, so that's how I do it, and they'll make the changes and stuff, but you guys probably can just do it out all yourself, you know, my 13-year-old can do everything on the computer himself, he doesn't need me. Right. Well, can we get a big round of applause for Michael Wolf? Thank you so much. <laughs>